Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to welcome this morning the Honorable Finance Minister of India, Arun Chaitley, and we all remember. Please. We all remember the discussion we had last year, Minister, and which we want to pursue today. But before um, starting a dialogue, and it should be a dialogue um, um, with the Minister, before starting the dialogue, I just want to take one minute to welcome you um, very cordially, our partners, members, uh, friends, to this um, India meeting which we call now National Strategy Day, uh, short, precise, action-oriented. And I would like uh, to thank particularly our partner, uh, the Confederation of Indian Industry, CII, represented here by many members, but by the President, Sumit Mansumno, and uh, the Director General Banerjee, uh, thank you for the great cooperation we have established, um, not only in organizing this meeting, but in general. The theme of this meeting is uh, delivering growth in the next context, and we will uh, look at some of the specific challenges of India uh, in very intensive interactive sessions later this morning and this afternoon, but we have the great opportunity to create a kind of framework for our discussions together with the Minister of Finance. Now, Minister, last year when we met, you presented your reform plans. When you look back, are you happy about what happened this year? What lessons did you learn from what you achieved and what you may have not achieved during the last 12 months? Well, I have a reasonable sense of satisfaction. A reasonable sense of satisfaction because uh, over the last uh, 17 odd months, uh, I think there are a few pleasant experiences. The confidence uh, of both uh, domestic investors and international investors in Indian economy has been restored. This has happened during a time when the world is passing through very challenging moments. We've set a direction uh, for the Indian economy consistently with every measure we are moving in that direction. And we are not allowing uh, any policy change which is of a contrarian direction. I think India has become highly aspirational. Unlike what happened, uh, let's say, 21, 24 years ago, where uh, those who wanted to obstruct change and reform were in very large numbers also, also within the ruling dispensation. I think India has evolved out of that kind of situation. Within the government, there is an absolute uh, consensus and unanimity about the direction to be followed. The popular constituency which supports change, reform and growth now has become much bigger than the one which resists it. I think this is on the more positive stance. Um, I'm not going into macroeconomic data, which everybody is aware of. On a more challenging uh, <coughs> side, well, India is a very, very highly functional democracy. And uh, a federal polity. Uh, I think the response of the states has been extremely positive. Most states have been competing with each other 
in order to march forward. That, that's another high point that I've seen. Uh, the difficulties are, uh, when I said uh, 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 a very vibrant democracy, that you will have people for political reasons taking a political position to obstruct reforms. Now, within the general mass of uh, public opinion, the support for that is very little. But temporarily, they may be able to halt or stop certain measures. But I think once a direction is set, uh, uh, the movement for that change will go on. And I must say, having taken a large number of steps already in that direction, I can at least uh, look down the tunnel over the next one or two years. I think I'll still have my hands full about the direction to be followed. Minister, I think the vision is very clear and it's felt by everybody here. So it's a new spirit in India. Um, it's also, of course, reflected in the World Economic Forum's um, competitiveness report. I never have seen such a jump in a country in a positive way. Um, but um, when I listen to the, to the people here and I would, uh, to, to our members here, there are two issues which come up again and again. Uh, it's the goods and services tax and, of course, the land acquisition bill, which have been um, uh, promised and uh, even a date has originally been set. Um, what would be your a message to the business community which is so eagerly um, expecting this reform? Well, I'll, 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 uh, when I uh, uh, talk about the goods and services tax, I'll take that opportunity to let you know generally about uh, the direction of the taxation reform in India. Mm -hmm. And I'll come to the GST uh, as a part of that. You see, I had inherited uh, uh, a legacy where the taxation policy of India and our processes had become uh, literally a drab on the Indian economy. Mm -hmm. Now, when I started off, uh, it was a retrospective tax. It was... Uh, 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 some exaggerated demands uh, which were uh, uh, really frightening uh, both international and domestic investors. And I had a table full of those uh, problems. And these are not easy problems to be resolved. Particularly if assessment orders have been passed, uh, you have no executive power to set them aside. They can only be set aside uh, either by a change in law or they can be set aside by uh, a judicial or a quasi-judicial order. Now, consistently, we worked in a direction to remove uh, that fear of a highly adversarial and an oppressive tax structure. Now, I must say with a sense of satisfaction that a very large number of those issues uh, are now behind us. Mm -hmm. Systematically, one by one, we've been resolving each one of them. That uh, fear of the retrospective taxation is gone. Two or three of those problems uh, still remain. And they remain really because of legal reasons. And I have publicly announced uh, that uh, we are looking for uh, uh, processes uh, by which we can resolve some of those issues also. Even with regard to domestic taxation, I think we are making now the processes much simpler. Uh, uh, people file returns online. People get refunds online. Uh, there is hardly an interaction between the uh, uh, interpersonal interaction, even now queries uh, since last week will only be addressed online and responses will be taken online and orders will be passed. Uh, uh, so it's becoming far more reasonable. Uh, uh, of course, there will be aberrations which we'll try and address. Uh, I've also announced a roadmap for direct taxation uh, uh, to bring it, the corporate tax down to uh, uh, 25% while phasing out uh, some of those exemptions. And I think I'm going to publicly put in the public domain over the next few days uh, 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 some of those exemptions which we intend to phase out in the first uh, round. The first tranche of reduction of the corporate tax, I hope to do it in very near future, uh, 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 whenever the new finance bill comes up. Now, having said this, the indirect taxation reform which is the G goods and services tax, uh, has been promised by us. Now, we made considerable headway. The parliamentary standing committee had recommended it. 
the lower house by two third majority has passed it. Mm -hmm. Almost all state governments are on board. And I must say, even the state governments of the Congress party had actively supported it. The chairman of the empowered committee is a finance minister belonging to the Kerala government itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we've continued the practice of uh, giving the chairmanship to the, a member of the largest opposition in order to build uh, a consensus. And uh, it came up in the upper house. The standing, the select committee of the upper house had also approved it. And therefore, I must say that a national consensus has been built. The trading community in India, the industry, the business, the popular opinion, all supports this. Almost everybody has editorially backed it. At this stage, uh, I say this with a sense of uh, regret, that uh, there was a policy somersault as far as the Congress party is concerned. And regrettably, it was led by the people who had moved the the GST bill itself. And this policy somersault was not for any policy reasons, it was for political reasons because uh, the policy seemed to be obstruct. I've been discussing with a large number of members of the Congress party itself. And uh, even in the last session with all others supporting us, we had the numbers in the upper house. And therefore, <coughs> with numbers in the upper house, we could have passed it, so the strategy changed. You don't allow the house to function. Now, of course, these are uh, problems that we, challenges we have in Indian democracy, but this can't go on indefinitely. As and when it is put to vote, it certainly would be approved, because I am quite confident we have the numbers on our side. In any case, within months from now, the numbers in the upper house are going to tilt a lot more. And therefore, uh, 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 that, that makes it far easier for us. Am I willing to discuss this with the Congress party? I've repeatedly said I am. I've been so far discussing it with their leaders, and I can't find any uh, 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 at least uh, conceptual opposition to it. Uh, I'll again, once again, speak to them and try to make them see reason. I think GST is only a question of time. Uh, uh, it's only a question of time. They can delay it by obstruction, but since obstructions don't continue indefinitely, uh, I think uh, as and when it's put to vote, uh, I see GST becoming a reality. I have both the supporting legislations that we need to implement GST in readiness. I also have uh, the IT backbone necessary for it absolutely in readiness. So the moment the upper house passes it, we can get 50% of the states to ratify it at the earliest and uh, be in a position to put it into motion. <coughs> the second factor you mentioned about the land bill. You see, availability of land is, 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 a, is a prerequisite uh, as far as any growth is concerned. Uh, uh, urbanization, suburbanization will be a reality. Infrastructure, land is required for rural Development land is required for rural irrigation, electrification, housing schemes. Land is required for housing for uh, the underprivileged. Land is required. And if you don't make land available, uh, I think the, the, the growth process itself comes to an end. Now, obviously, the persons who either sell land or land is taken from somebody must be paid and must be more than adequately compensated. There is no difficulty. Now. Again here, the, it was the Congress chief ministers amongst others who had suggested that we needed the changes. So the government in good faith accepted their advice and went ahead on a particular course of action. Once we brought it to parliament, they changed their strategy and said, no, we will oppose it. We again called the chief ministers who said it's a concurrent list subject where both the center and the states have a parallel jurisdiction. So we know the requirements of our state. We'll bring about amendments which are needed in the state, provided the center agrees to give its assent to it. We said, we'll give assent to whichever state wants it. So there is a change of strategy that let the states bring about any change if they think it is necessary. And the states have now set that process into motion. The first state has already sent its proposals to the center. We've accepted it and they've notified it. And therefore, I, I'm sure when the other states come up as and when, and this will only happen in those states which need the land. And ultimately, I think uh, uh, this issue by this, meanwhile, the ordinance has lapsed, but the bill remains before the select committee. 
there are some changes on which uh, 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 a consensus, some minor changes on which a consensus is possible. So we'll try and see if in the coming session that consensus can be worked out. I think it's very reassuring to see the clear vision behind now and, and when I look at uh, the discussions I had over the last days, I think it's very important uh, that this uncertainty is fast removed because it's a uh, blockage to investments, even if you had a big increase in FDIs. But, um, Minister, I have seen that um, uh, capex of Indian business is not at the desired levels. Uh, now you have here um, some of the heads of the big Indian companies. What would be your message to them? You see, as far as uh, 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 investment in India is concerned, uh, I am conscious of the fact that the private sector investment has been slow. And uh, it's been slow because uh, private sector was also conditioned by two factors. <clears throat> One was demand, along with the slowdown world over, which had also impacted the Indian economy. The other was a large number of Indian companies, and I think uh, Indian private sector has to seriously introspect, had overborrowed and overstretched itself. And therefore, with expanded capacities, they now have to utilize their existing capacities before they could uh, think in terms of investing more. Uh, 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 I'm conscious of that fact. And therefore, uh, for me to get into a self-critical exercise over this uh, and blame them for what happened in the past, I think will serve absolutely no purpose. And therefore, ordinarily the principle is that uh, when growth is to take place, private sector leads the government. But when you are uh, uh, emerging out of a slowdown mold, world over it's public investment which takes over. And fortunately for us, uh, uh, with the current global oil and commodity price regime, the public investment resources, uh, uh, additionality of those resources are available. And therefore, we are making every attempt to make sure that on infrastructure and several other areas, uh, public investment increases. And I'm glad that uh, over the last few months, it's significantly increased. Not only from the government coffers itself, but I recently had last week a review meeting with the Indian pub public sector companies. And uh, a very large number of them have been sitting on piles and piles of cash. And uh, uh, we've asked each one of the 35 major public sector companies which were represented in that meeting, uh, which was sitting on huge amounts of money to start expansion programs. So between the government and the public sector, there's a very large uh, 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 public investment plan which is picking up. And I think uh, along with this, with the liberalization in the FDI policies that we have done, uh, India has uh, attracted one of the largest FDIs anywhere in the world. So with public investment, public sector investment, uh, large FDI coming in, I think the investment cycle itself has revived. And therefore, in certain sectors after sectors, I can now see, for instance, take uh, <coughs> some of our infrastructure programs like the highways. Private investment had absolutely come to an end because the, uh, those who built the highways, their projects had become completely non-bankable. Now, with a large amount of public investment thrown in, I have now seen over the last few months, uh, the private sector also has jumped in in, in a big way. Uh, uh, similarly, we are addressing issues of stress sectors. Steel is a stress sector uh, because of uh, the, the surge of Chinese uh, uh, steel which is coming in. So we've been, by taxation policy, we've been trying to address those issues. Uh, power is a stress sector. In the next uh, couple of days, we are likely to announce um, some major policy decision in that regard to get that sector out of stress. And once that happens, uh, I'm quite sure uh, uh, the, the, the private sector also uh, uh, will, uh, will start participating. You can't have a country which has a 7 to 8 percent growth and which aspires to get into the next le uh, league. Uh, growth taking place without a private sector participation. Obviously, once it picks up, uh, the private sector uh, gets out of the current scenario and its uh, investment would be seen already in telecom, etc. We are seeing uh, in IT, in the startups, uh, we are seeing a big private sector investment already jumped in. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm quite sure this is likely to expand. Minister, this leads me to the next question. Um, 
See, I think you should be commended on um, the progress you made in uh, terms of the of macroeconomics, uh, the macroeconomic environment. Now, you referred to the infrastructure investment, and the figures I heard, 250 billion, out of which I think um, uh, 120 um, billion, uh, or 150 billion, I'm, I'm not, uh, you, you certainly have the right figures, uh, but a large proportion uh, will be financed by debt. Now, how do you see uh, the capability of the uh, government? Um, who, who, should, who should be responsible for the debt? Who is at the end? Uh, you see, this is one area. When we started off, uh, I think we started uh, <coughs> uh, uh, with one clarity in mind that we need to build on the infrastructure. But we were unsure of domestic resources. And therefore, even last year, we'd been um, uh, 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 calling conferences of international investors, etc., thinking in terms of our own um, investment fund with a government participation and so on, which is, which is still on track. And therefore, how the investment figures would uh, read itself, uh, there was a, a, a lurking suspicion. It was more aspiration than actually money that you could see. And fortunately, since uh, we had uh, uh, the oil prices drop, the commodity prices drop, uh, and I think one of the uh, biggest unsung reforms of India in the last few months has been uh, uh, the subsidy reform. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we started systematically by uh, subsidy as far as oil is concerned, diesel is concerned, uh, 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 the LPG is concerned. We have now got pilot projects on food on. We have a pilot project on um, uh, 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 kerosene, which is on, and the DBT. And this itself has helped us to save a lot of money on that front. It, it's a very significant amount. Added to it, we used the drop in the, the, uh, the oil prices, uh, uh, passed on a lot of benefit to the consumers, put the balance sheets of the oil companies back in shape, and then created the infrastructure cess. So it got shared three ways. And that itself has uh, helped us to put a lot more money. So I have uh, a very large amount of money as far as the national highways is concerned. In fact, I am already running short on money as far as rural roads is concerned, which comes from the budget itself. And therefore, I'm thinking in terms of adding to it. Uh, as far as the railways is concerned, probably the biggest unreformed sector, we have a massive program now from uh, in railway infrastructure to railway stations being redone in 400 places. Uh, 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 the tenders are going to be out very uh, 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 shortly. Uh, I got the Life Insurance Corporation to put uh, 1 lakh 50,000 crores uh, as a 30-year loan on uh, a soft loan available to the railways itself for infrastructure investment. And therefore, we've used this regime in a big way to start funding the, uh, the, the, these infrastructures. Added to this, uh, uh, I think uh, our, our entire proposal to get uh, in addition to public-private partnership, uh, uh, the international funding into uh, uh, the investment fund itself, which is also in the final stages of formation, so that we can fund each one of these sectors where we find uh, short of uh, investment. There are some infrastructures in which uh, uh, private sector is willing to come in, ports for example. I, I think there is no dearth of uh, uh, even domestic investment uh, along with joint ventures which is willing to come in. The, the big problem area for us at the moment as I speak to you uh, is the power sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think that's an infrastructure issue which we are going to be addressing uh, uh, literally in the next uh, couple of days, if not in the next couple of hours itself. Uh, we've almost finalized our uh, approach in the direction because we have a system where we are generating more power than what India needs. In fact, there is the first time in history where we have surplus uh, resource. The generation companies are in a difficulty because there are no takers for that power. You have a grid which can take it to every part of the country. 
but your last mile, that is the state discoms, have now become uh, extremely vulnerable because some of the states decided that not charging people adequately for the, the user charges for the power was good politics. Now, it wasn't good politics, but it was certainly bad economics. And those uh, discoms are not in a position to lift that power itself because of the financial condition. So how, unless we are able to revive their health, the whole chain itself is suffering. And therefore, this is one area of infrastructure which is essential, uh, uh, which has remained unaddressed for the last so many years. I think it is one which needs to be tackled immediately. And our current focus is literally on this area. Minister, um, do, are you satisfied with the legal framework which exists now for public-private partnerships, or could you see any improvements in order to mobilize particularly the private sector for the large see, infrastructure? The, the uh, legal framework uh, has to be very radically changed. And it has to be radically changed, uh, 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 for instance, uh, and I'll here give you four or five uh, things which need to be immediately done. The first is, contracts are to be performed, not breached. Now, our Indian law, as it stands today, uh, 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 some of the provisions are quite obsolete. I only yesterday had a discussion with the law de uh, legislation department and asked them uh, to start working on a change uh, in our specific relief act, which is uh, uh, extremely obsolete uh, in this direction. It provides for damages, but not performance. Uh, enforcement of contracts. For instance, our arbitration processes go on and on. So last week, we've already issued an ordinance uh, which now provides for a fast-track arbitration by a single arbitrator uh, with very little scope for challenge to be disposed of in a time period of six months with no extensions at all. So the arbitrator will have to sit day to day and just finish any contractual dispute. Thirdly, if disputes which go to court, we've now or issued an ordinance against last week providing for a commercial bench in every high court. Uh, the committee which was drafting the bankruptcy law, I'm told, has uh, already finalized its recommendations and is likely to submit a report to me in a couple of days. I'm immediately going to translate that recommendation into legislation so that the exit law is also put in place uh, as soon as possible. My endeavor will be to try and introduce it in the next session of parliament itself. Minister. We should in integrate the audience into the dialogue, and I would take two questions, but also two concrete proposals. So let's not only have questions, but who has a concrete proposal to the minister? Or wish that? A unique opportunity for presenting wishes. No wishes? Minister, you must be perfect. <laughs> so, uh, one wish, one wish, one, one proposal. Arunji, good morning. I'm Pranjal Sharma. Um, I am uh, asking a simple question. You know, during the elections, uh, the BJP campaign was fantastic because you brought in domain experts from various fields and, you know, you ran a fantastic campaign. My suggestion and proposal is that can this government also create a framework where domain experts, specialists from other sectors can join the government and help in your uh, agenda for change? That's a very, very, very valid uh, 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 suggestion. Uh, you see, the Prime Minister himself uh, interacts through the social media and his uh, own uh, site, which he operates personally, literally. Uh, he's quite amenable to these suggestions. But uh, I think there is a lot of scope uh, particularly with the think tank apparatus which the Niti Aayog is now in the process of uh, creating. I've had at least uh, two meetings for that uh, kind of a think tank which is building up. And I, I see a lot of uh, uh, positive scope there. Let me look uh, at, uh, let's say, foreign um, uh, 
um, investors sitting here in the room. Any, any proposal? Any, any question? Yes, please. Minister Jaitley, it's Alan Davies from Rio Tinto. And uh, firstly, congratulations on the reforms that you and your government under the leadership of the Prime Minister are bringing through. I know we caught up very early in the change of government and you are doing exactly what you said to us at that outset, so congratulations on that. The reform of the minerals sector, um, there's been some success in getting coal into power stations. I'm very interested that there's now a surplus of power. Um, but foreign investment in the resources sector we've talked about, and as you know, we're on the verge of uh, bringing the first uh, mine, new mine development in India in 40 odd years. Uh, but my proposal goes to the exploration, and the government's doing a lot of work on exploration, but when we look at the growth that you're stimulating here, uh, for Indian growth that will need metals and minerals to continue its growth. Attracting foreign exploration at the very early stage of greenfields and allowing that to continue through to the mine, we're working with your departments on that, but my proposal would be to allow uh, that very greenfields exploration to happen and then allow the continuity through to mine without going to auction at the intermediate stage. Thank you. Would you, would you, would you, would you put this uh, uh, in a note to me? Any other suggestion? Yeah. Hi. Um, Minister, uh, you started on the railway part by saying that uh, it's one of the least reformed sectors. At the same time, we've got the soft loan from the life insurance for that huge amount of money. Actually, I would be worried for all those who are investing in the LIC because the concern would be what is the extent of due diligence we would go through in <coughs> supporting the railways because actually the real problem in the railways, is it one of financing or is it one of internal reforms, improvement from within? Because then if my belief is if that happens, it will naturally attract funds. I mean, railways is a sunshine sector. <clears throat> yeah. You see, uh, uh, let's look at the way uh, railways has been run all these years. Railways has been run in a manner where you've added about 10 to 12 percent uh, in terms of track size. Uh, size in the last 68 years. So we are almost a little more than where the British left us. Secondly, our infrastructure also broadly remained on the same pattern. Over the last many years, consistent railway ministers did three things. One, they would make sure that uh, a large number of trains were announced as a part of the railway budget. Whether they were workable or not workable was not seen. Most of them never started. It was just a populist announcement. Some projects would be set up in the minister's own constituency. And uh, the railway minister took pride in the fact that he would never hike tariffs in the railway budget. But then there would be a hidden hike uh, done throughout the year in order to meet the expenses. The result was uh, that railways in that sense never grew. With such a vast infrastructure in terms of track, in terms of train, rolling stock, etc. Now how do you reform it? So the first thing we decided this year was, the minister said I am not going to announce any new train since till I strengthen the existing framework. He has to strengthen the tracks in order to take the load itself. Amongst the reforms he started, in railway infrastructure, we've opened up uh, foreign direct investment. We've also allowed private investment to come in a, into a big way. Some proposals, I am told, uh, have come in. Additionally, the whole program now 
to start through the private sector participation, the redevelopment of 400 major railway stations through the Swiss challenge method. The whole method has been finalized. It will be out in public domain soon. And therefore, you will soon have a situation in the, over the next couple of months where you have 400 railway stations over the country being developed by private sector, including international participation itself. So he's now started on this whole process. And then uh, you go into more modern high-speed trains, etc. So I think uh, uh, rather than just go into populism, the railway ministry is today being run uh, uh, far more with a professional game plan in mind. Now, once you embark on that professional game plan, you start a little slowly because you have to put the systems in place. But as far as we've made more budgetary resources applicable, <coughs> we've given the comfort of the LIC money to the railways. We've allowed private sector and foreign investment to get into that area. And let us, uh, I think uh, uh, the railway minister is a very uh, uh, thinking man. And therefore, let us uh, uh, give him uh, a few more months before the movement in this direction itself uh, starts. The railways has to reform. Uh, uh, as a part of the larger reform process in India. Minister, we had uh, a breakfast and, uh, in a small circle and we discussed the forthcoming, I would call it forced technology or industrial revolution and its impact on jobs and skills. Now, India has to create already under present conditions um, 10 million jobs a year. Now, in addition, you have now robotization, you have three-dimensional printing and all those new technological innovations which will, radicalize, which will have a radical uh, impact on, particularly on skills. How do you prepare? I mean, one response is the entrepreneurialization of the population to allow young people to create as many jobs as possible and so on. What you is see, your response? How, how, I mean, this is such a big issue and see, challenge. I think uh, if you look at three things happening, or three or four things happening, one, the network of education in India, earlier by the state, and now by even a very large private sector and civil society participation has very hugely expanded in India. So we are throwing up a lot of uh, human resource year after year. The skill development program which states have taken, the central government has taken, and the central government is concentrating on those 68 uh, skilling areas with a new ministry coordinating the whole action. The kind of infrastructure creation we are concentrating on, I can almost see India's uh, manufacturing grow. Now, I've been speaking to some of my friends in the industry who look at it from their own uh, industry's point of view. <coughs> and at times are worried themselves as to why manufacturing really has not been growing. But I can now see trickles of growth. You see, rather than in all uh, uh, figures uh, 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 which are assumed figures of how much we'll grow this year, uh, uh, there is only one real figure. The rest are matter of calculation and assumption. And the real figure is uh, how much is the revenue you are earning. Uh, as I speak to you in early part of uh, November, where seven months of the year have passed by, uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, positives I can see is a huge increase in indirect taxation revenues. Now, indirect taxation revenues are not assumed figures, they are real figures. Now, as of 30th of October, uh, or 31st of October, the actual rise uh, has been uh, 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 a staggering 36.5%. 30, now, this 36.5% is a looks bigger because of certain uh, additional revenue measures which we took since November last year. So those additional revenue measures add to it. But if I take it at par with last year's figure, divorce that additional revenue measures, it's still 13.5%. So this 
so both excise duty customs and customs means raw material and uh, capital goods service tax on a year to year basis it's 13.5 with additional revenue measures it's it, 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 it's much more now this is a real increase now this actually indicates that the manufacturing uh, itself is picking up and if with a large amount of infrastructure uh, investment this picks up uh, i think that's another one area the last area which is again as i say uh, uh, and i i see it as probably a government scheme which will have uh, the maximum impact in addition to skilling is this mudra scheme which we launched uh, uh, a couple of months ago now mudra is uh, soft loans being given by the banking system to for low cost entrepreneurship now there are 25 crore 250 million families in india the least 60 million out of them in terms of their economic strength 6 crore out of them the object is that if we can't accommodate them in terms of jobs either in the government or the private sector can we empower them to become entrepreneurs in the unorganized sector after all the unorganized sector in india has created 110 million jobs 11 crore people are employed because of them now the banks have they used to go to private money lenders and borrow at 25 30 36% <laughs> now banks have started lending to them at 10% and so on which is a huge uh, decline in interest rates this year out of those 60 uh, 6 crore families we hope to touch about 1.75 crores and over the next 4 to 5 years about all 6 crore would be funded as i speak to you like the janadhan and all these other schemes about uh, 65 lakhs this year have already been funded and these are people living in villages these are people living in slums some people take loans to become vegetable vendors fruit vendors some young lady in a slum sets up a beauty parlor somebody sets up a small tailoring unit or a small uh, boutique of her own now these are the kind of businesses they are touching so to address the employment generation of indian economy while the economy grows you allow technology skills uh, uh, the jobs to be created you will also have to address the bottom belly and i think uh, that's equally important minister we celebrated yesterday the social entrepreneur of the year and uh, we selected <coughs> her her out of 150 um proposals and it shows just the strengths of what you described what's going on in terms of social entrepreneurship let me let me because we are coming to an end let me uh, ask you a, a question related more to international matters um in preparing uh, the annual meeting in davos where we hope you can participate um some observers say we will be very much under the impact of a fed decision in uh, mid of december so that's the next uh, meeting now um some people expect some turmoil of the markets My question is twofold. First, uh, how resilient is India related to um, market turmoil? Uh, but second, um, maybe in a more uh, political way, what would you wish in terms of changes in the international financial monetary system? I know you made some comments on this recently, so it would be interesting. See, as far as uh, 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 the international situation is concerned i think there is one um, significant change which has taken place over the last few years earlier you had uh, a crisis situation once in a decade once in 15 years i think that has now changed uh the world is so integrated uh that the newest norm in the global economy is turmoil and volatility so you will now have it every now and then uh so if something happens in greece you will have a turmoil for a few days um, if china slows down or if the uh, 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 currency is devalued in china alternatively if you have a payment crisis in some part of the world 
or you have the Fed rate expectation in the United States, this does send ripples across the world. Now, I can't say that uh, Indian economy won't be impacted. There are some crises uh, uh, which impact us uh, 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 much lesser, some impact us directly. And therefore, if the, the Fed rate hike takes place, uh, certainly you will find uh, uh, a turmoil for some period of time and then situation settles down. Uh, uh, when you had the Chinese currency being devalued, uh, uh, you had a transient uh, 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 turmoil and then the situation uh, settles down. My own view is that uh, we allow, uh, our strategy has to be to strengthen the basis of our economy, to have our macroeconomic uh, 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 strength in place, so that the impact of this uh, is very transient and temporary. And then we are able to show some resilience and bounce back, which has been traditionally the character of the Indian economy. And I think uh, the kind of uh, fiscal prudence that we are practicing and the kind of data that we have today uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a very, very rare situation where almost every macroeconomic data uh, uh, is fitting in almost perfectly and therefore likely to improve, not likely to go down itself. And the impact certainly would be there. Uh, I think rather than the actual change, it's the suspense which has been impacting us for the last uh, few years. And in, as far as changes in the international monetary financial system which you would wish is there anything? Um, of course, we talk about IMF, global governance yes, yes, here. We, 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 we do speak in terms of uh, the quota reforms as far as the IMF is concerned. And uh, the ball is now in the United States uh, uh, court itself. And uh, the uh, Treasury Secretary has been saying that uh, he's extremely keen uh, to give effect to it. And he's trying his best within their domestic systems to have it cleared. Thank you very much, Minister. I think we are coming to an end. I, I just could summarize probably what we all think here. Uh, A, we have to thank you for your leadership. B, we have to encourage you to continue with your vision and with your reform steps. And um, finally, we hope to see you uh, soon in Davos, um, reporting on even further progress. But again, thank you very much for joining us this morning and opening this meeting.